All right, well, let's get this going. Welcome to Career Insights, uh, AF Seattle's first Career Insights event. We are talking about the modern creative freelancer tonight. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to introduce Myson, our moderator, who's going to introduce everybody else and, and get everything rolling. But um, I just first want to run through a couple of pieces of club business. Um, we are looking for a board of directors members. We uh, are seeking somebody to take over the reins of the Addy Awards. The American Advertising Awards is our biggest event of the year. It's our biggest function of the year. We need somebody who wants to put on basically the Oscars for local advertising. It's kind of a big thing. Don't be intimidated. We have a lot of support. You have a co-chair, you have a committee. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We're looking for somebody to take that over. Um, we're looking for someone to uh, run events and we're looking for someone to handle our money. Um, treasurer role is open. If you're interested in these jobs, go to afseattle.com slash board and check out the descriptions. Uh, otherwise, um, we have a COVID resources page on our website. Um, it's uh, afseattle.com slash COVID-19-resources or just go to the homepage and you'll see it. But that's full of resources for creative services industry people. Um, there's uh, selections there to help you find money, to help you get work, to help you increase your skill, to help you change your mindset and to inspire you in your work. There's all kinds of stuff there and we update that very frequently. So all the resources are current. Um, some of the things that the panelists will be talking about today um, are linked in there. Um, most notably the things around the payroll protection program if you're running a small um, agency or um, need to worry about like uh, these bridge loans and things like that. Um, they will all explain that kind of, that stuff um, very soon. Uh, I think that's all I've got um, in in terms of that. Uh, yeah, that's it. Um, awesome. Let's get awesome. this thing kicked off. I'm yeah, going to hand it off to Myson, um, who's going to introduce. Actually, you know what? Let me let me do, let me introduce you properly, Myson. I've got the um, I got that, I got that up here. Should be more prepared for that. Um, oh my gosh, yeah. This is what happens when you have 20,000 tabs open. Uh, I totally get it, you're, you're all good. Lewis, I we've, don't have the participants we've, thing we've open. Connected, we've connected before a long, long time ago in the- uh, Oh yeah, and so. I'm really glad to have you here yes. because um, you have been, you're at Essential Water now your social media manager there, but you have been right. on the scene in Seattle for a long time and you have worked in all right. kinds of roles and you've worked in different cities and you've worked with um, in different capacities. And so you know the freelance hustle and you know what it's like right. to be on the client side and on the agency side. So we're really glad to have you here and bring your 360 perspective to uh, to our event. So Myson, take it away and I'm gonna right. pop off the video for now and jump in when appropriate later. Awesome, awesome! Super excited to be here. Uh, you know, moderating my uh, my first event, so this is uh, this is great. Thanks for thanks for having me. Super excited. Um, yeah, you know, and and to build off what Lewis is saying about my background. Yes, I've I've been I've had a lot of experience in, in advertising and um, at the agency level, and and now the brand brand side of things. And you know, a lot of the similarities. Um, you know, that I've definitely been seeing it is that. You know, we are now in that on-demand creative kind of era right of things and um, that's something that I'm seeing consistently across the board where you know we needed it yesterday right and uh, you know with uh, with COVID coming in now and you know us being in some in these these uh, what we're hearing now is these times right is it's become a lot difficult more difficult to one find you know obviously find projects to market yourself and 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 three you know you know what you know maybe even take that step into independence and we have a, a lot we have some really good perspective with our uh from our panelists today we've got a nice eclectic group of folks here that have tons of experience and 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 uh, a lot of insight to provide you guys so we're super excited um so yeah we'll uh let's um go into some some introductions uh to some to our pan to our panels and we'll start with una Let me try that again, uh, it was on mute. Um, my name's Una Rokita, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company named Lance. Um, prior to Lance, I had a uh, about a dozen years plus of PR and marketing experience across 
agencies, in-house experience, and then working with startups actually to help launch them. Uh, took me to Israel actually uh, to work with an investment fund uh, to help launch different startups in new markets. Uh, something that you guys might be more familiar with is I helped launch Lemonade Insurance and um, also Meerkat at South by Southwest in 2015. And uh, Seattle native, uh, at one point, I also helped launch Healthy Paws Pet Insurance, uh, which is a top rated uh, pet insurance brand across the country now. So uh, a wealth of experience, um, but that led to my actually freelancing across different companies. And with that learned that it is a struggle out there, <laughs> not just in this moment in time, but there's very little to help you structure things as a freelancer. Um, there's no set way to enter into freelancing. And so with that started our company of Lance um, with the premise of giving you an app that you can download. It's actually free right now on the iOS and Android store, just L-A-N-C-E. And it's a place where you can sync all of your financial accounts and actually get an immediate view into all of your expenses, all your transactions. We pre-sort everything into your personal life and your work life, give you a sense of your running estimates in terms of your income, expenses, and tax responsibilities on a rolling basis, um, and are actually pulling in different partnerships in terms of helping you set up your business banking, uh, which will be tremendously useful, as um, I'm sure Luke will allude to with all the PPP, stimulus payments, loans, uh, you know, any sort of UI or PUA benefits you're applying to, et cetera. Um, and then in the future, we look forward to helping guide you through retirement and business insurance options as well. Um, but this is where we're at today and really excited to be part of this panel. Thanks for having me on. Um, and hopefully I'll answer some questions that are out there as well today. Awesome. Thanks, Una. And Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mason. Uh, to the uh, 20 people that are attending this, I'm waving to your names uh, uh, and letters. It's, it's nice to see you. Always funny to do this, not in front of people. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come here and uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing and our background and how we're trying to help and the excitement thing, exciting things that are happening freelancing. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Mike Germano. I'm the president of a company called Camino. We've been around for about three years. Um, and we are a network of vetted uh, uh, people in the creative space. Uh, we have about 30,000 freelancers and over 300 agencies. So it's, uh, uh, it's been very uh, exciting ride of growth. And then uh, with COVID coming up, it's been exciting in the, in the worst ways. Uh, but it's uh, unfortunately allowed for uh, uh, the technology adoption and a very unique marketplace for us to have this conversation. And prior to that, you know, I understand the kind of a, a lot of sides of this. Uh, I started an agency right out of college as the first social agency because we were nerds building network sites and we thought that was the future. Uh, so we were lucky and we were more excited about kind of doing really creative work online. And unfortunately, the company kept growing until it was a couple of hundred people and we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, and we found out that the agency way of hiring people full time to try to do great work hampered us from trying to do sometimes the best work that we wanted to do. Uh, and that we were stuck doing the work for the employee base that we had. And, you know, we didn't understand the freelancing market back then and, and, and really just try to build a company. And so after we sold our agency, uh, uh, part of a large network called uh, uh, Vice Media, where we had about, you know, we had hundreds of people all over the world that were more of a freelancing type basis to not only get the content from the reporting side, but also do some of our advertising and our, and our unique uh, uh, content creation. So we really saw the value of that from a global side. I think that was very exciting uh, to see when you found people who were specialists or had you know, unique perspectives that we were able to really tap into such a, a large network and how much better I think that made not only our creative, but, but the community at the company. So uh, after that, join, join Camino and, and, and really we're excited to uh, uh, not only help freelancers and agencies, but we think the, you know, we, 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 I, will, I could talk probably too much and get myself in trouble by saying where I think the downfall of the hold codes uh, are going to happen and really the value that people who are the small agencies and freelancers to actually just focus on the work that they love. It's super exciting. I'm, I'm very honored uh, to work on a platform where we help people who really love things find what those are. Um, and, you know, I told you how many people we have on the network, but, you know, we also have 1,400 opportunities right now with, uh, I think, over... $20 million of, of, of projects and jobs. And um, 
you know, I'm, I'm in the New York area, so clearly COVID hit uh, uh, our area harder. And, and uh, we're, we're, glo we're a global company with our headquarters based out of Calgary. And we made a pivot pretty quickly to offer kind of free accounts to anyone who's impacted by what happened with COVID. And we know that there's a lot of traditional agency people who are now being introduced to freelancing because they're working from home anyway. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's an unfortunate trial by fire. Uh, and we've had a couple thousand uh, uh, profiles set up for this, and we're trying to get people make sure that they feel uh, uh, secure in their jobs again and give them opportunity again. But I'm hoping that this is a chance for people to really adopt uh, uh, the excitement of what it is to really uh, be a freelancer. The ups and downs, and we we have some great people on the panel who can tell us all the little hidden things and important things behind it. But I'm happy to share more about my perspective of where I think the freelancing industry is going, why uh, it's, it's going to be so valuable and probably the best creative renaissance that we have in, in our industry. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, great insight there, too. Uh, yeah, let's go with Luke Fry. You're, you're next. And oh, and really quick, can you guys, um, panelists, if you want to drop your, your, your links to your companies in, uh, in the chat window, great. So folks can have that as well. Yeah, also hey everyone, to, I'm uh, Luke Fry, or Lewis, did you have something? Oh, I was just going to say, um, we do have all the links. Um, if, you, if you don't save the chat or want to see them later, you can get back to everyone's links, um, either on the website, in the event listing, or at the Eventbrite listing. Um, they're linked both personally for LinkedIn and Twitter, and for their company. Um, so there's a lot of ways you'll be able to get to them. Great. Awesome. Well... Uh, I am pretty excited to be here as well. It's definitely a fun opportunity to meet people in similar spaces from a different perspective. Um, my start, I, so I'm a CPA, Certified Public Accountant uh, in Washington, uh, but we help clients all over the U.S. And I'm the co-founder of Timber Tax. So we focus primarily on tax compliance and planning uh, for self-employed people, entrepreneurs, freelancers, Really, um, my start was with Bench Accounting. So you might have heard of Bench.co. Uh, they originally were a tech stars company in New York. And then once they got their funding, uh, I moved with them to Vancouver, British Columbia, and then helped grow and scale that team, which was really insightful, intriguing, fun, very much startup world. And uh, once uh, they grew to a certain point where, you know, a lot of outside investors, a lot of outside um, bigger corporate type people came on, I didn't fit in anymore. And it, I'm definitely much more of a freelancer type minded person. And so that's when my business partner and I started uh, really a, a practice based on tax consulting, planning, uh, and just working to be an advisor. So we still partner with Bench. We have a referral relationship with them. They're a wonderful resource for cash basis bookkeeping uh, if it's something that you're looking to outsource. Uh, and then we step in and help make sense of those numbers and working through you know, what it means to uh, plan for your taxes and entity analysis, quarterlies, and deciphering a lot more of this uh, strange world that is constantly changing. Um, we do a, a lot of um, single owner business, especially around S Corp savings. But most recently, with all this COVID stuff, as I'm sure everybody's been aware, uh, the big thing that we've been helping with is uh, the payroll protection program loan. So most of our clients. Uh, who we helped. Uh, if you were a client, you know, we're just working with you to help get those applications in. And it's really an exciting time to see all this money come through. But now we're just seeing, okay, now the next hurdle is you have this money. How do you track it? How do you make sure you're spending it right? And then what are the rules to really get it forgiven? So that's something we've actively been working through with most of our clients. And obviously unexpected is everyone's going through a lot of unexpected work right now, but it's been really nice to actually be able to help people in this time as opposed to be stuck and unavailable, which I totally relate to the freelancer mentality of creating your own destiny, you know, for better or for worse. And that's really why we come along and help people on the tax side of things. Great. Great. Thanks, Luke. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, we see some folks getting in the, uh, the chat window here. If you have any questions, feel free to, 
drop them in. And, um, you know, next we'll, we're going to kind of dive a little bit deeper into some of your companies and, you know, some, and, I'll, and you each can uh, weigh in on, you know, what your company's uh, goals are and what, what benefits they, they have for, for freelancers. And, uh, yeah, just kind of give your spiel on, on your, on your business and, and, and what, what, uh, and what your goals are. So if you want to start us off, um, let's start with uh, Una. Yep. Sorry. So the goals of the company and, and what we're looking to accomplish for people. Right. Right. And yep. what, what, and like what your company does. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're, uh, I'll, I'll voice what the other panelists have said, but, um, you know, it's been, uh, really great to orient ourselves as a team and as a company around the fact that we're in a position to help people at this point in time. Um, I agree with Mike and, you know, we were talking about this before the call started that, um, you know, this is, this is a terrible time, but it's also an incredible opportunity for people to take a deep breath and really think about how they want to orient themselves going forward. I think that it's so typical as a freelancer to just kind of dive into the work and start working for different clients or join up on a team with a project um, that before you know it, you're kind of five years into it and haven't, you know, really oriented yourself around what types of clients you want to work for and what kinds of projects you really want to pursue to develop your resume, uh, much less evolve your skills and how that even impacts the rates that you're charging and a whole host of different topics. And so, um, you know, I think that that's a really great evolving conversation um, in this space. And we have seen it just given that we've been doing weekly webinars um, around the PPP, around how people can start goal setting and planning differently um, in this space kind of broadly as freelancers. And so that's something that, you know, I, I would think that is really heartening across the panel is that we can be in this position of service and, and helping people in this moment in time. And, you know, we just as a company really look forward to growing and helping more people. We've had hundreds of people registering for our weekly webinars, you know, thousands using the app and, um, you know, seeing a lot of usefulness um, and, and frankly learning. And that's what we're about is, you know, working with, you know, accountants and working with client marketplaces and people in agencies, whatever the situation is, to really help develop the understanding of how to run the business of yourself much better um, and more effectively. So you have kind of a basis from which you're starting and then being able to optimize yourself and grow into the future. So that's really what we're dialed into as a company. Awesome. That's great. Cool. All right, Mike, you want to give us your, your uh... sure. all right. <clears throat> um, cool. So I think sadly I, I introduced part of the company when I introduced myself, because a lot of us, you know, we, we tend to tie those two things together, which maybe is a problem in itself. Um, but you know, the goal, there's a goal for Communo and there's a goal for why anyone would join a company and what would they do? Uh, the goal for Communo was, was really because we, we felt that, we felt that people wanted to be passionate about the work that they were working on. It sounds so simple and it sounds so easy, but it's really hard. And look, I, I'm, I'm from New York and I see so many people who are there and they're there only because that's supposed to be the epicenter of, of our creative industry. And you want to look at them and, and go, why, why would you want to be here if you don't like living here? If you want to live in Denver or if, or if you want to live, you know, near your family in Kansas City, why would you not live there? And, oh, it's, it's the only opportunity because the jobs are here and set the, you know, the, uh, the best opportunity. And so, you know, because Camino also started in Calgary, I think there was a little bit of this uh, um, uh, chip on their shoulder about how do we bring the greatest jobs and the greatest opportunities and you can live where you want to live work on the projects that you want to work on. And that's how the best work will happen. I think everybody here knows uh, the goal of working in advertising is not to just work at an advertising company, you know, or, or, or it's actually to do great advertising and really try to change the world. But so, you know, what being a freelancer and taking that, you know, that, that, that freedom, there's, there's really, there's really nothing like it. We want to try to create a network uh, uh, that, that really gave that opportunity and take, take away the hardest part, which was getting work, 
you know, so many great freelancers. I mean, you're seeing, you're hearing about other panelists who, who have great platforms to help you with the, you know, the harder parts in the finance. And then there's the hard part of actually winning, getting that work and being in a trusted network where you got to make sure that no one is going to unfortunately screw you over or, or take advantage of you or, 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 you know, put you in a, in a position in the business world that you, you don't want to be in. So, you know, that, that's a hard part of freelancing. We've heard horror stories of people who've done it. And then all of a sudden the client isn't, you know, on the up and up or, or things get kind of caught up. And next thing you know, uh, they're getting stiffed on a bill and, and the, this is people's livelihood. So how do we create a trusted network? Um, and, you know, it started with freelancers and grew and start with agencies who are willing, to, are willing to do it. And we're, this isn't public yet, but we're about to launch with brands because with 87% of brands having in-house agencies, right? That's really going to hurt traditional uh, uh, agencies. But what it is going to do is it's going to open these brands to want to bring in people on a project basis. And the big thing that uh, uh, if you're asking us for the goal for our company is, you know, the goal for our company is not to take a percentage of everyone's job, like an Upwork or a Fiverr. That's not us. You know, we have a kind of a, a more of a, I don't want to call it a country club, but, you know, everyone's part of a network for a different reason. They pay their fee and they can play golf every day or play it once or have a membership just so they can tell their father-in-law they're cool and they have it or try to do business deals at the bar. But, you know, we're a network where we don't try to take, you know, we're not trying to take a percentage of your money. We want you to meet good people, do great work and be passionate about it. And, you know, the goal for me is, um, you know, I, I kind of joke about this a lot. I've said this before, but, you know, when you look at the word freelancing, it actually, uh, uh, the definition really more comes from uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, free as in what you love, what you love and Lance throwing yourself into it. So everyone likes to think of the medieval times of, you know, someone on a horse and you would rent a freelancer to fight your fight for you. And that sounds like really in the New Yorker me gets excited. But when you hear the other definition, you think of people throwing themselves into something that they love. I don't think freelancing is, is a backup plan. I think that is a unbelievable luxury for you to actually find that passion and connect with it. And my goal in life is the work that I've worked on one. And I was lucky because I started an agency. So when I got, was able to do the work I loved, it was not only the best work, it made me feel better. It made me a better person. I came home happier. I felt mentally stimulated. And my, my goal in life is to create an opportunity where everyone likes different things. Everyone likes a diverse uh, 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 thoughts in, in what they find enjoyable or what they want to really dive into. And, and my goal in life is to find those people who are passionate about it and connect them with those passion projects so they can work on it. And they yeah, can balance cool. out, you know, and, and so that's really what, what my goal is. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And, and Camino is the, hopefully the network that can make that happen. Great, great. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. All right, Luke, you want to tell us about uh, Tim Burtex? Mike, you got me excited too. Right. <laughs> it's, it is really fun to remember uh, a lot of why we start our own things or work with the people we do. And uh, something that is really different about Timber, if you were to work with us, for example, on your taxes, is you know we're not searching for startups. We're not searching for big corporate accounts to do tax planning consulting. We do self-employed people, you know, single owner businesses, entrepreneurs, not, um, and we are digital first as well, which is very similar to what Bench was. And it's really interesting to see how our current situation has forced a lot of this stuff to happen a lot harsher and cleaner and prove that, and, you know, these people who think, oh, you need to be in an office in a chair, you know, the reality is doesn't really matter where you are. You can be in Calgary, Vancouver, New York, Kansas City, and still do excellent work, whatever is feeding you energy and, and just show up. And I think that we're realizing that, you know, you can show up just as impeccably virtually as you would uh, remotely, obviously, um, as you would in person. Obviously, you know, I still miss seeing people in real life, but uh, the reality is certain work we now are just continuing uh, to leverage the power of the internet, which sounds cheesy, but it's real. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that is, I think, become a lot more clear to people who maybe are starting on a freelance or um, have had some, maybe got laid off is this illusion of security that comes from having a W-2, you know, and it's just mm -hmm. so not real. <laughs> it's yeah. just you're insulated from it. You know, I, I guess as a marketing professional, you understand, you know, 
the actual thing might be different. Like the money coming into the business is the same, but you're just getting paid uh, on a pay stub and usually less than you might uh, if you were doing it on your own. Obviously, there's higher highs and lower lows with being self-employed. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is even the playing field uh, mm -hmm. as far as it's not motivating for me to do tax planning for a startup because a startup has no profit. There is no tax planning. You don't have any profit. There's nothing to plan around. Uh, it would be easier and I would make a lot more money if I did that. But what really is motivating is, okay, the, the government penalizes labor. They tax labor more than they tax regular income. And so how can we really play with the same rules that bigger corporations are? And that's something that we work to minimize your self-employment tax as much as possible and and really to help people think through this idea of you know working alone or working on your own doesn't mean you have to work alone and and what it means to mm -hmm. you know work with a professional and very much like what mike said about you know this is not just because we're online or virtual doesn't mean it's cheap right right great awesome great insight as well uh, and yeah, just for folks that are tuned in, you know, we uh, we have this Q and A also, uh, feature in this in this Zoom meeting. So if you have questions there, feel free to to drop those in that in that Q and A area. But so yeah, I guess uh, thank you all for kind of for giving us that background and and info on your on your individual companies. I guess you know I'll kick it off with you know, some of some questions for you guys to kind of, you know, chew on. Um, so yeah, how did you guys kind of all get started and, and becoming, you know, these kind of sole, I guess, proprietors and, and freelancer, you know, kind of working on, you know, for yourself, so to speak, and what, what made you kind of jump, take that leap uh, of, of going independent? And either any of y'all, any of y'all can kind of start it off. I'll just make sure everyone gives sure. each other some fair amount of time. Uh, yeah, I, I would say, um, I've been independent my entire life. Um, when I started, you know, like I said, I started my company, actually my first internship was with the company I started, uh, cause I didn't want to intern someone and get someone coffee. So I found a loophole and me, my friend who was in another college. We both started a company and it sounds glamorous, but the truth was we were heading out of college. So we had no expenses and we had no family. We had no bill. We had nothing. So we were eating ramen noodles. So we were like, let's just keep eating ramen noodles. And I'll, I'll be very blunt. And this is kind of, you know, a personal thing. But the reason why I had to kind of go into business for myself is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little, uh, people would classify as maybe learning disabilities. I don't process information like everybody else. And I knew for me, honestly, it was going to be a struggle to be in a traditional career where all of a sudden I'm going to have to sit down and be like, I can't read all this. This is just not going to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that if I, you know, uh, if I had my own independence, I could find ways to, to find a solution to the problem, which at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do, right? You're being hired or you're being, you know, asked to work to find a solution to something. And I knew I wasn't going to feel comfortable in a traditional job and I wasn't going to, to be able to excel at it. So even though I worked double the amount of hours, you know, I found a way to build my own process and built a home that then more people wanted to come to. So, you know, my first company was more because I think I started because I couldn't get, I probably couldn't get a job. And, you know, when we're talking about when to start things, you know, we signed our, we started our company in 2005. We moved to New York and signed our first lease uh, uh, three weeks before the Great Recession hit in New York City. So, you know, you want to talk about bad timing. But for all those things, because it was my own, it was a different passion. And it, was, it was a whole different thing. And so I think my independence started because, like I said before, I knew I couldn't and it wouldn't succeed in the normal you know, playing ground. And I, and I say that to anyone else, if you feel that, you know, a traditional job, you're like, Hey, I'm not best suited for this, or they're not really valuing my, what makes me different and what makes me special. then that's not a place that you should be. And it might seem scary to go out on your own, but it is so much actually safer because at the end of the day, the only person that you can say, you know, you don't get a, when you work for yourself, you don't get to come home and be like, my boss doesn't get me and gives me crappy stuff to do. Like that is your fault. So like you only have yourself <laughs> to blame. And so you tackle problems differently. And uh, uh, I think for me, um, I could only know the independent life. And that's why we're, once again, I'm trying to create something to help, help those independent people find that path. 
Great, great. That's awesome. Una, I, what made, yeah, Una, what made you yeah. kind of take that? I have to say, I was so anxious initially. I kind of was at the other end of the spectrum, and I think this is just being, you know, my context is being a first gen, uh, first like born American from parents that came here as refugees. So I was like super cautious mm -hmm. and especially coming out of college, I went straight to DC, total gray suit, don't step on toes kind of culture. And mm -hmm. so my entry into freelancing was like after many years of developing experience and like feeling kind of that I was ready to do it mm -hmm. and that people were asking me to freelance. Um, and so I was at the other end of the spectrum um, but, you know, I, I do think that it's a little bit of a just know yourself to some degree and kind of, you know, whether you don't feel like you are fit as a cog <laughs> in an agency or a company or whatever, and that you have so much more that you want to be doing and managing, I think, um, or, you know, that you're being drawn into it. And that's kind of, you know, the, the ends of the spectrum, I think. Um, there are some questions coming in that I think tie really nicely into this and, you know, my experience of, you know, starting the freelance is that I kind of did like a real kind of a couple weeks, maybe of what are my skill sets? you know, what do I think I could charge for mm -hmm. hourly or retainered work? What kinds of clients do I want? And it, when I say weeks, it was kind of a couple of weekends of mulling over it and actually like structuring out um, what do I want to do freelancing wise and who would I be most suited to in terms of clients. And I do think that there's a good kind of self-assessment that you can do. And then, you know, just to do a quick a little plug is I've also written an article um, in Forbes about kind of doing a 60, 30, 10 model on the, mm. your work income streams. So I think what's really common amongst freelancers is that we actually kind of run multiple hustles typically, um, whether it's, you know, in my case now being the CEO and founder of a company, but then still occasionally consulting to companies um, or, you know, a, a freelancer of, you know, in an advertising space working on UX design and then maybe content or whatnot. Um, you know, I do think that there's a value in thinking through kind of what's your anchor job? Where are you skilled? Where do you have kind of a couple clients in terms of resume anchors that you can sell yourself on and market and maybe use them as references? Um, you know, something that you can promote in a portfolio of sorts. And then maybe there's like a 30% in there that is something that like, eh, maybe you're not as skilled in, or it's something mm -hmm. that's a bit more aspirational. Um, it's a bit of a side hustle um, that you're trying to like level into or something, or it's kind of more fun, but you don't have as many consistent or kind of turn on opportunities with clients. And then maybe a 10%, and this is a little bit of a Google model, like keep 10 or 20% where you're like exploring something, like you're taking classes on Coursera or Udemy, you're like thinking about monetizing something, or it's like something random and fun, like roasting coffee beans or selling plants like on your stoop or something that just kind of is different in terms of creative juices, in terms of like fun or more flexible, um, or it could be something more practical, right? Like driving for a lift or, mm -hmm. you know, walking dogs on Rover or something. Um, but I kind of like to think about a little bit of a pie chart in terms of orienting yourself across different jobs and hustles that you might have more control over or less, you know, and are just awesome. enjoying them. Awesome. Great answer. Thank you. Got it. We have another question in the in our chat window from Susan. Uh, for people new to freelancing, what are common mistakes? How can they avoid those mistakes if possible? And and what mindset do people need to move away from? In your guys' per, uh, perspective, I'll let Luke uh, take this one first. I think my bias is the biggest mistake is not hiring an accountant right away. But um, <laughs> you know, at least keeping your business transaction separate from your personal really and uh, Mike was supposed to be the disagreeable one but I think I would uh, disagree with some of what Una said as far as I think a mistake many people make is always keeping the, a safe option and I think this really dives into 
you know, what is your personality profile and what's your appetite for risk? How many kids do you have? Do you have a spouse, you know? So maybe mm -hmm. because I'm, you know, not having to deal with as much of that, I'm willing to take way more risk. And I also see a lot of people who, um, you know, maybe keep that full-time job and I just see it, you know, lingering. Uh, but I also know people who have a really clear plan and if they write it out and they have these buckets broken out, it's going to work really well. So I think being a freelancer or having your own business is really just a huge path of self-discovery. And um, I do think that not having an accountant or talking to an accountant is a really big mistake to, to assume generally uh, that you can do it all. I think, again, it doesn't, because you're working on your own doesn't mean you're not hiring professionals still. Right. Okay. Mike, you have any uh, in insight on that? Common mistakes and, and you know mindset. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, once again, maybe this is a New Yorker or me, but you should always charge more. Um, um, you're a very valuable person. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest trap I think people get into is charging hourly. Mm. I'm completely against the charging hourly thing. Um, you know, once again, you have a skill, you have a trait, and, and anything that comes in the creative process, you know, you can't ask someone like, okay, put one hour towards this and I'll pay for that. So I don't, I think people should realize that they should be able to charge by the project, right? And I think it's, it's easier for the client to be able to budget it. You can also budget your time. Uh, one of the greatest insights we have is we actually have a lot of, um, we have a pretty good group of stay at home parents who are on our platform who were in the industry and are now trying to balance, um, um, you know, kind of a, a, a new life where they might be the primary caregiver and have maybe 10 hours a week that they can put towards this. And what's interesting, and I don't want to tell the member's last name, her first name is Bonnie. She's great. And she goes, you know why people like hiring me? Because uh, I have 10 hours a week and I have to get the project done. So I'm not going to come up with a bunch of busy hours going back and forth with the client. And, she, and, and she's like, this is the time I have. I will get it done. Um, and so I think that all of a sudden, you know, if you think about it, if you're charging hourly, you're, you know, you're almost penalizing yourself for being more efficient. And that sounds silly, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think charging by project, be comfortable to say that, you know, you, you also have to realize that you have a tremendous amount of experience that, you know, this isn't manual labor, you know, where you're, where you're charging hour. That's the reason why, you know, salaried employees, you know, they're not using you 45 hours of uh, a, a week, you know, uh, every hour they're using you because, you know, they're, they're, they're needing you full time because they can have your full time heart and energy when they need to deploy it. So I think, you know, charge by the projects one, be confident in what you have, you know, uh, 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 don't go into business and don't go into business. If it seems too good, it's always too good. When someone hypes it up too much there, it's always a racket. Don't, you know, it, don't trust it and, and feel comfortable with like saying like, look, here's basic contracts, you know, follow up with that paperwork. You know, it, it's better. There's a balance between trying to be friendly and open and, and try to go with the wind versus being taken advantage of. And, mm -hmm. and it's very unfortunate. And, you know, once again, a lot of people come to our platform because they've, they've been taken advantage of and they feel stupid. And number one, you shouldn't feel stupid. You know, you shouldn't feel bad about yourself. You didn't make a bad decision because you trusted someone, but like learn from it once and don't let it happen again. Uh, uh, but that's shame on them, not shame on you. Um, um, but, you know, I think uh, those, are, those are a couple ones. But I mean, like I said, go project versus hour because that's always going to put you in a bad position. Gotcha. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag on to that because I have like three very specific things that I think are mm -hmm. also often missed and they've become like a bit of a rallying cry for me. Um, is one, we are far too transactional about what our pricing is. You know, somebody asks you how much you are and then you want to give a number. And that's even before hearing what the project is or how autonomous they want you to be on it, you know, how much information they're going to give you and, and what that kind of review process is going to be like, et cetera. So I really am trying to get people, and I, I hope this makes sense to everyone, but talk about a range, right? Like this type of mm -hmm. project is typically in the range of a retainer or a project fee of you know, 7,500 bucks to 1,500 or 15,000, you know, but let's talk about exactly what you need and then what you can expect from me based on kind of where I fall in that range and the project falls in that range, right? So keep it open to a conversation 
And then you'll also, through that conversation, learn more about your clients and kind of their expectations. And you'll have a bit more of a conversation on the front end, but it'll avoid a lot of, you know, mismatched expectations and conversations that are going to be more uncomfortable and challenging in the back end. Um, so I think that helps put you in the best possible light. The second one is if you don't know what the, those ranges are or how you should be pricing yourself, just ask people, do your own market research, talk to five people through Facebook groups, through this community, whatever it is, and give your, get your market research and then reference it. Hey, I've done some competitive research, you know, this is my range, you know, this is likely where I fit in it based on my experience and what you can expect from me. You know, that's something that agencies do annually, and we just haven't coached ourselves in doing that in terms of how we present ourselves. Um, so I think that's the second one. The third one is get a deposit. For any sort of project work, mm -hmm. get a deposit. Because if you send that contract and get the first deposit, tell them that you won't start working on that deposit, especially for bigger projects, so critical because it adds an element of seriousness to this entire project and that you expect to get paid and they're paying for your brain share, right? Starting at that very point. And if they don't pay you on that deposit to get the project started, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can delay starting it and say, look, we really need to resolve this before I get started because otherwise I'm going to start looking for other clients to take up this time, you know, and it creates a sense of urgency that you don't have on the back end once the project is completed, right? And then also you're breaking up the amount psychologically. It's all of a sudden not a $15,000 project in a sense. It's, you know, half up front, 20% up front, and then a smaller amount on the back end. Um, and you're checking their own ba their bank balance. You're checking their seriousness about the project, how responsive they are, what you you can expect as a freelancer from them. Right. So those are, those are my three tips on that. That's interesting, since you know in Seattle this market is there's a lot of you know recruiters out there. So how does that play you know that deposit aspect of it play a role in that when you're kind of using a third party to to place you so to speak? Yeah. I think to that point, and I see Mike um, going off, <laughs> off being muted, but I, look, you know, th the biggest challenge to that is that they can say no, but frankly, when you stand up for yourself and, and have that confidence, like Mike was speaking to, you know, to, to ask for that and say like, look, this is, you know, I'm confident in my experience. I'm confident in my ability to deliver. And this is how I work. You are actually setting the stage for how you're going to work. And it reinforces kind of the experience and the value and what, what kind of respect you are requiring of them. And, you know, I think this is, this is a, a shift that we have to come forward with as freelancers in terms of what we expect and how we stand up for ourselves and reinforce kind of our worth. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mike, you wanted to jump in on, on that. We have a couple other, uh, uh, I'll give you, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a minute for that, your response. Okay, I'll be quick. I think recruiters are uh, the same thing is going to happen than what happened to travel agents. Uh, that, that's going away. There's a, there's a perfect mixture of, if, if, you, if you look at it, we're going to have, there's a lot of unemployed people right now, so it's not about falling right. labor. Recruiting is only going to be for a very niche and, and very tiny space. Um, and giving away that much of a, a, a dollar amount to someone else to find you a job is crazy. And once again, when I had an agency, I never used a recruiter because I hated having to pay such a large fee to someone else. And I'd rather give that to the employee. And you almost felt like the, you know, I would say maybe it goes to something different where it's an agent, you know, like I want a continual agent versus a recruiter where I feel like is trying to place someone at a company for just one year. They're in the business model of trying to kind of not find you that dream opportunity and dream job. They're in this different model of kind of putting you in something, you know, year after year or, or not, they're not really selling you as much as they're selling someone else. So I, 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 I'm completely against that. I think that uh, employers are going to want to pay you and not have to pay a recruiter because they don't, they might not see the value, even though there is some, and of course there is some value in that, but for some recruiters, but with what's happening digitally and, and, and networks that can connect people, their services are going to become less and less valuable. And next thing you know, they feel like their people are pushing and don't genuinely understand you. And 
you should spend more of that time getting to talk to these clients and understanding their problems versus, you know, trying to have a recruiter. You just put you in a position. Right. Okay. Great. Awesome. Well, we, uh, with about 10 minutes to go, we've got, uh, we've got one pretty good question here in, uh, in our chat window. So, um, and I'll let Luke, uh, can let you jump in on this one first. So how, so kind of in a nutshell, I guess, how can freelancers today best position themselves for, for success? You know, considering what, you know, this, the, the times right now and, and, and that on demand kind of, uh, creative, uh, expectation. Yeah, I think that's a great question, uh, but it's also really dangerous and probably something that everyone uh, is dealing with is because what does success really mean? And I, I think that you have to be real with yourself about, um, does that mean you can be a full-time freelancer? Does that mean you can buy a second property? Does that mean that uh, you know you get to appear in a magazine? And so it's one of those things that I think hedonic adaptation I think is what it's called where you rise to a certain level and then you're like okay now I want fancier shoes and then you want fancier shoes and so just be realistic and write it out you know maybe working with a business coach maybe just deciding on a number maybe deciding on you know I'm assuming most people are freelancing not just because they want to make a bunch of money because there's probably easier ways to do that but um you know, maybe deciding what sort of a milestone, like this year I got to talk to somebody I would consider an idol uh, and he called me an entrepreneur and that was like, oh, there I did it. You know, obviously there's more work to do still, but um, I think be realistic with what success means for you and that's going to be a really good indicator. Cool. Um, another question that just like, just popped in, that's good that these are starting to come in. Um, Oh, here's a good one from, uh, I think it's Karma. Uh, at what point do you know when and if you need to add or hire people to join your business and onto your payroll? I, I could certainly elaborate a lot on that one, but um, I think, again, it probably goes back to your definition of success, where is your definition of success, you know, working this big project where you need another person? Is your definition of success the, you know, what is it, the five hour work week? And so that's totally going to depend on how you see yourself showing up. Um, mm -hmm. There's certainly a step function of cost that we could work through on a spreadsheet together, but uh, I think it might come back a little bit more to, you know, are you sane? Do you have time to live your life? Are you willing to make these sacrifices? Um, does your spouse want to leave you? <laughs> Those mm -hmm. types of things might matter too. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think going back to if you can charge on a project basis, it becomes pretty evident of when you need to hire people mm -hmm. because you're getting, going back to the project, you need to, you are selling a solution. You're not selling hours, you're selling a solution. And mm -hmm. what, like, you know, what I like about it is when you start freelancer, you start to understand business a little bit, time management, you start to understand you kind of that producer mindset. So as your business grows, there's opportunities all of a sudden done well for a client and they want you to do more and you might not be able to do it, but you know, you can work closely. And once again, these small agencies of, you know, a handful of people are so efficient and work well because it's kind of close knit. Our agency, we made more money at five people, more profit than we had 20, you know, then we made, you know, probably more profit at 30 than we did 70 was probably, poor. I should have called Luke earlier, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think that uh, you, you start figuring that out. Uh, and adding people, I wanted to say, be careful, bring in other freelancers, you know, don't go straight for a hire. Sometimes you might think, and that's maybe because you're unable to scale your own operations and you think you have to have someone full time, you have someone full time that starts chaining you down in terms of a, of a financial thing. And you, and when you think of other freelancers that you're, you're, you're joining with on project, finding those right people's mindsets, that's when you know, you can start bringing people in. And they'll start bringing you into projects. So it's, it's a good way to also backstop, you know, from you from not having potential work. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I was jotting some notes down. That's a, that's an interesting uh, way to look at it. You know, you're selling a, like you said, you're selling a solution. You're not selling hours or, you know, uh, a project, right. It's, you know, what problem am I coming in to solve? Right. So it's a good way to look at it. Awesome. Awesome. Great, some great conversation. Awesome questions coming through. Uh, one more came in just now. 
does pricing change for a job that before COVID required you to be physically present versus now being able to do the jobs remotely? Una, what do you think on that one? I think that really depends on the kind of job and your assessment of how effective you are at that job in person versus remote. Um, you know, I, I would argue that if you're in advertising, unless you're kind of a brand ambassador that's kind of required to be there physically or something, um, you know, what I've seen in terms of companies is that they're actually getting more um out of their their workers um working remotely than they were in person right because there was a lot more water cooler conversations and now you know i'm hearing this from a lot of executives that i'm friends with is that everyone's kind of on tap uh available for more hours in the day they don't have to deal with commutes maybe they have to juggle some kids in the home or or spouses schedules and stuff like that but i think you have to kind of know what your job is and are you performing it as well or maybe even better remotely than in person and you know look at the pricing there um you know a, a lot of this is so flexible but to, to mike's point you know and and i live between new york and san francisco so i'm a, a blended approach in terms of charge more um what we have seen, you know, I previously worked at HoneyBook, uh, one of our portfolio companies when I was in the in uh, the VC fund, you know, they deal with workflow management for creative for pro professionals. And we found that minorities and women charged an average of 32% less than white males for their services before you applied friends and family discounts and all that other stuff. So one, I just have the gut instinct that everyone is undercharging for services because you know, we're not accounting for taxes, we're not accounting for healthcare, you know, uh, benefits and stuff like that. Just, it just doesn't, it's not something we're used to doing, having worked initially in corporate settings, most of us. And then beyond that, people start to undercut themselves at a tremendous rate. Um, so, you know, the, the I think the, the quote usually is, you know, say the price that you would just barely keep a straight face saying. And I think that's a hard one to go, mm -hmm. go with in the midst of COVID. But still, you know, you have a value. That value hasn't gone away. That experience hasn't gone away. That know-how hasn't gone away. Um, and people still need to work. Companies still need to function. And frankly, they're going to need that to a greater degree uh, to survive uh, the after effects of COVID. So you are going to be even more valuable um, in most of your freelancing jobs um, uh, than you were before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's there's two parts to that question. One, uh, charging post COVID, and two, charging for remote work. Obviously, remote work, uh, uh, people think you should be charging less because it's not as valuable as not in person. Being in an office is just is just this is just. Uh, uh, the evolution of the assembly line because you had to be there and they had to watch you and that's how they thought they were getting something out of you. But if you look at a business, they're going to start realizing the tremendous amount of additional cost, office space, uh, kind of companies, you know, someone has a bad day, they're coming into the office and all of a sudden that there's, you know, issues with employees and, and, and all of a sudden there's this, there's almost now this added expense when you're adding these people and it's all because you have to watch them or it's all because a manager has to watch them. And I would say that that's why they think that's more valuable because you're actually physically giving up more of your time. Going back to if you're just getting the project done, if you're getting what the person's asked to get uh, uh, to get done, there's a different pricing model. And I would say you should be able to charge more if they want to install software or use certain tracking tools. So if they really want to see what you're doing all the time, and you know they have these tools, fine. You can you can install those and see. You know here I'm using uh, uh, Figma, and you can see everything I'm doing. I should be able to charge more for you because you're kind of checking in on everything, everything that I'm doing. But I guess the funny thing is you can charge more, but use, I guess you could charge the same, but use less time and take on more projects. So you can be kind of working, you know, uh, the same amount of hours, but accomplish, you know, one and a half more. So you're making more money. And then I would say the COVID thing is interesting because uh, uh, the capitalist in me who says, um, you should always charge more up until they say no, and that's when you know your, your price point is. Uh, uh, unfortunately, COVID is gonna create a huge uh, uh, supply, not a lot of demand. You know, we're seeing all these brands uh, are pausing 
for this quarter or they're moving it over to the next one. That's a very scary thought, right? So I, I'm afraid for a lot of people because I don't want to just always say charge like crazy. Uh, 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 you know, if, especially if you don't want to do a project, you don't like them, just charge a lot. And if they say yes, be like, oh, I guess I'll do this one, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, but I, I think it's also important to be realistic of what's un ha unfortunately happening to the market and that there's a lot mm -hmm. of people who are all looking for jobs and brands are slashing budgets. And it's not because they're afraid. It's because they don't want more ads going out that feel weird. Right. So like all of a sudden you're seeing them slash budgets because they either have the, the ad that says, you know, we're all in this together now more than ever. Or they can't show the ad of everyone playing in the park because post COVID has changed advertising and trying to run to do it. So people are holding back. They're a little bit scared from, from what to do. So unfortunately, there's a lot more opportunity. Uh, 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 so there's a lot less opportunity out there. And there's too many people. So if you're new to freelancing, it's OK to kind of get your get your feet wet. Uh, don't get too hard on yourself uh, uh, from that standpoint. That Okay, but if it's a specialty and you're the best person for it, you know, and you have some unique perspective, that's where you're at a premium, right? Uh, and I use this analogy a lot. There's some industries that I've done work on where I knew so much about it and it would take me such less time and I was so much better at it because, you know, I didn't know luxury, but I knew watches really well because I had many watch clients. So if, you, if it was a watch brand, I could charge a lot more versus I didn't know luxury fashion. So I, I wouldn't be good at it and I didn't know it. So some, that's why I keep going back to if you're passionate about one thing and you focused on it and you know it, you only want to focus on that niche industry because now all of a sudden your premium is there because no one else has this value. Uh, uh, so that's where you can feel comfortable. If it's very generic or jack of all trade, Jill of all trade, that's when you have to maybe be uh, uh, understand the, the market dynamics a little bit more on, on your pricing. Great, but, great. Yep. Awesome. I want to get to this, uh, this really good question from, from Christy. But before that, I want to announce our, our first poll. It, it's, a, uh, it's a question around, you know, your freelance status. Um, so if you want to, if the, those who are, you know, attending, if you want to go ahead and, and shoot us those answers. This is we're not allowed to vote, just so you know, so. That's the yes that's 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 fine meanwhile you know I'll, I'll ask this question from from christy you know her question is uh you know she's uh dancing around the idea of going freelance with design illustration photography uh direction and branding uh what words of wisdom or advice would you give in regards to those first steps particular particularly in the seattle market um and she also goes to say it's it's common to hear it's you know the market it's saturated and it's it's a kind of a you know all about who you know kind of space here i know we are all in different markets but if you have any kind of relevant answer or you know some relevance to, to your market that that'll probably help as well i do think that uh freelancing or starting your own business is definitely not for the faint of heart and so if, if you're really teetering, the quickest way to know if you're going to be able to do it is just to decide to do it. Um, and then you'll find out. And in some ways, totally business is a who, who you know kind of space. Uh, but you can certainly build that for yourself. And uh, there is an element of hustling for sure. You know, like I actually, when we started Timber, I moved to Seattle and didn't know anybody there. And then now an overwhelming majority of all of our clients are Seattle. Just because I went to networking events, I took coffee chats, I just, you know, hustled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. I'm going to be just a little contrarian to that again. I think that Luke and Mike are a little, a little uh, more risk comfortable, uh, which is funny because I'm a startup founder. But <laughs> um, I think um, just in terms of freelancing, I have, a, you know, I, I walked into it a little bit uh, while I still had a, a job and kind of went to the networking events. And it was just my comfort level with it. Um, and again, kind of did that little bit of self-assessment. Um, again, this is where I think, uh, personally, I think you just need to know yourself and what's going to actually instill the most confidence in you um, or the most hustle, right? In terms of, you know, some people 
believing that if they don't have a plan B, they're going to get the shit done and get out there. Um, and you know, there are those of us that definitely do that. That's much more my personality with the startup. Um, but as a freelancer, I was a little less, you know, risk comfortable. And so I, you know, liked having that full-time job and then starting to do projects on the weekends in the afternoons, you know, and, and kind of wading into it until I felt like I would have a, a decent, um, you know, pipeline and or one that would convert within the next few months. Just another perspective on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think, um, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but when I hear what you say you, you want to freelance in, it's, you, you brought up five different things. And I immediately said, uh, I don't know if that, that's going to work. because, And I say that in a loving way because it's almost like when you talk to someone who you ask what their major is and they go, I major in this, 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 and minor in this. And, and all of a sudden you're like, well, what are you actually studying? What are you, what are you knowledge about? What, what can you do? And I'm sure you're excellent in all those things. But you either want to be a specialist in one thing or you want to be a, you know, be a generalist in visual, uh, 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 you know, uh, visual storytelling. So something that would encompass all of them, like I do visual storytelling on, on Instagram for this niche. Great. That can tie in all the things that you've said you've done, or I'm the best illustrator out there. I'm the best photographer. You know, I'm the, I'm the best photographer out there and focus on one. I get it. You're trying to sell all the things that you have done. You're trying to look, Hey, you know, come with me. I, I can do a, I can do a handful of these things. And that goes back to don't sell hours in those sell a solution. What do you need a solution in? You're mm -hmm. trying to tell some type of uh, uh, a story using using visuals uh, for this company, for this cause, you know, uh, uh, for this campaign. I can do, I, that's something I feel comfortable in. Versus uh, you're trying to sell bits and pieces. So uh, uh, that's something I I kind of recommend. And then second, I would say if you're thinking about it, and and I mean this lovingly because I I do know I do know Gary Vaynerchuk. Don't don't listen to these hype hype up people who tell you to be your own boss. If you need them to tell you to do this, it's not going to be a good place for, for, for you to be. Um, I, uh, it's just going to, unfortunately, it's, it's sometimes people glamorize being your own boss or being a freelancer and they, and they don't talk about the other things that are important, which it, it's going to go bad and it's going to go wrong. And I would say, make sure you have a friend you can talk to. I, I would say one of the things I, I, reg I, I felt very fortunate when I started my business, I had a business partner and realized how much our my therapy between each other was important because you're supposed to tell everyone else like, things are great, this is great, I'm doing amazing, everything's right. And really, you're scared, you don't know, and that's okay. So I would say, make sure you have someone who you can really confidently and truthfully talk to that's gonna help you kind of understand some of the things and don't get sold into it. We're not timeshare salespeople, like, you know, you could be your own timeshare salesman, be a freelancer, like, you know, they're, 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 you know it, it's okay not to want to do that. It's okay to say, this isn't the, the life for me, but. Uh, if you do it, you know, focus on the one thing you love the most and, and it might take a little harder to get started, but it, it'll be more valuable in the long run. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, quick one around COVID and, and how it's affecting business. Uh, question from Twitter. Uh, you know, as a freelancer, is it is it possible to service small businesses in this job climate? Uh, yeah, that one and kind of how uh, COVID's kind of affected you know, clients and projects currently in your guys' experience or, or what you've seen in the industry? I think, uh, can you repeat the, the Twitter question? It was just about... As a, as a freelancer, is it possible to service small businesses in this job culture? Perhaps they, need, they might need us not more now more than ever. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean... We have a lot of photographers in Washington, specifically wedding photographers too. And so you can bet that most of them are totally stalled. Um, but it also opened up another opportunity to do more like elopement photography. So it is interesting to see how this has shifted some of the opportunities available. I've also seen them post more to their stores or you know, creating prints available to purchase. I'm sure that all of them are still way down, but um, I think that you know now is a time where the relationship, if you have one already with a client, is really solidified because you're that person who is going through this with them and helping them with whatever it is you are working on anyway. Uh, so if, if you already have a client base and they might not have a project for you right now, it's a wonderful time to reach out and just say, 
hey, I'm here for you. Maybe you do something for free or maybe uh, you just do a friendly check-in uh, and just make sure that you know that on the other side of it, you're both still there. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities to service small businesses or individuals at this point in time. It just takes a little bit of creativity to think about kind of what you're good at and how that fits with people's just shifted needs. And I'll give you just two examples. Um, you know, when I was freelancing kind of day in, day out for startups and big companies and stuff like that, you know, I wanted something that was a little more turn on, turn off. Um, you know, not just retainer work, but things where I could have, you know, quick, high impact um, and get paid kind of a higher hourly rate um, with those specific projects. Um, and I could just kind of ramp them on and off as I wanted. And so I went out to um, VCs and said, look, for all of your startups that can't afford retainers, but have no clue when it comes to PR and marketing, I'll do a two hour session of whiteboarding with them. And, you know, it'll be 500 bucks or 750, a thousand bucks, whatever, depending on the size of the company. And they'll get a tremendous amount of value and they'll basically have a roadmap for the next six months in mm -hmm. terms of what they can do, what they should be approaching, how they can follow reporters, how they can engage early days, what kind of reporting they should be doing and publicizing. Mm -hmm. And that was like so high impact. And we would just drill in on that session and they would have deliverable collateral materials at the end of it and then guess what like six months out they knew who to call whether I wanted to work with them more on a retainer basis or I could mm -hmm. you know pitch them over to somebody else that was a better fit and so I got creative in that way and then in the local Seattle culture I have a, a number of friends there um, you know and, and I'm just thinking about one of my friends who is uh, a uh, contractor and you know I, I know it's a little industry off tangent but he you know had all the equipment because he's a contractor to do a number of different things and he just started a big Mike's business of like hauling your stuff and just coming to your house dumping everything in him disposing of it you know while people are a bit more homebound right now and you know just that that was him iterating on his business so i think you know in this moment of time it it requires of you but there's the opportunity to be really creative in terms of how you kind of shift your services and um and are supportive of people mm -hmm. awesome yeah and we're seeing a lot of brands doing that right um pivoting kind of adjusting their so you know quote unquote messaging during during this time as well so it, it definitely translates to the to the freelance world as well so yeah um how are we doing on time uh looks like lewis how are we doing on time there i want to make sure i want to be conscious of everyone's uh yeah work. we we threw an extra bonus 10 minutes on here uh 643 <laughs> uh that's pretty good though um yeah wow lots of questions there's still there's still a few more and um we're going to continue the conversation um with and invite the the vips and members into a video chat um just to close out the questions if anybody else has wants to um ask anything else in there and and um uh mm -hmm. we will we'll, we'll get that going and um here and i'll just start adding people through who are on the list <laughs> virtual velvet rope here sorry um yeah thanks everyone for for coming to who are on the regular uh attendee list um we really appreciate you coming through um send any questions um to uh you can send them to me president at afseattle.com if you have if you want to contact me with any questions about um the event um if you need to get um if you you know any anything around that um again the um information to uh see more from our panelists um on their their personal Twitter, LinkedIn, and their companies. That's all in the um, uh, that's all in the uh, either on the Eventbrite or on AFSeattle.com in the event listing. Um, we like to uh, get that all connected, or also in our LinkedIn, our social posts. Mm -hmm. um, thanks so much again for attending. Um, we will have another event next month. Um, don't have that quite nailed down exactly which what that's going to be, but um, stay tuned for more of this. And um, thank you all to our panelists. We're gonna uh, transition out of the little VIP thing. So I, there's nothing else panelists need to do. 
um, we'll just start adding these people into the, to the video thing and, and we'll get that going. So um, one second for me to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah definitely was a nice uh, host. Nice to meet everybody. Nice to meet everybody. And yeah, definitely if we have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to hit us up on LinkedIn and our, or our um, social channels as well, so. Okay, so I'm gonna start moving some of these guys over. We have, <laughs> yeah, it helps when people log in with the same, um, uh, with the same name as on their ticket. Uh, hold on here. <laughs> I'm gonna bring in someone that we, that, that Mike knows well, David is. Uh... <laughs> oh, <laughs> Let's what? see here if he opts to, to go in. Um, and that's, that's my brother, everybody. You're right. Uh, just, just <laughs> have Monica come in here, Richard Bristol. And I, Brittany. Hey, Brittany Eccles. There you go. Sorry, it keeps bouncing around because the attendees are leaving, so I keep losing the click. <laughs> Okay, this could definitely go a little smoother. Hold on. Oh, well, let me let Aaron in here. Um, I didn't see that. There we yeah, go. Yeah, I was going to say, let push her through. Awesome. I love it. Thank you for uh, promoting that, Aaron. You know, he, the thing is with uh, um, uh, uh, Facebook hashtags are just lousy because they don't sort chronologically and you can't see who's doing what unless you get no unless they also tag you when they do it so that's really weird hi Aaron yeah I don't think there's anybody else that's uh yeah I think we're all I think we're all good on our list here of the people who are still in who came in who came through um if anybody else is uh, of the regular attendees um uh, should be on here. Raise your hand. Otherwise, um, we're going to get moving on with this thing, and we'll just, um, uh, yeah, we'll get it, get that going. Um, so, Aaron, um, you are uh, welcome to unmute and ask a question of, of the panelists. Thanks for um, participating. Thank you. I had asked earlier the question about um, what advice would you give to be successful in freelancing. And uh, I think Luke had given the answer and said, well, it depends on how you define success. So to clarify, I am just starting out. I am remaking my life with a new career after years of being home, raising and educating my sons and now divorced and needing to support myself and my sons for the rest of their time with me and maybe build some more retirement as well. And so my definition of success is basically not becoming destitute and being able to <laughs> Do those things so I'm open to any kind of guidance I'm starting a freelance editing and proofreading business oh. I think um, you know that sounds like obviously a really big reinvention so like good job it's definitely hard um, but what I would say I would still aim higher like I think you never want to aim at your bare minimum because it's kind of like you might end up there. And so you obviously have a skill, you're smart and you're driven to be here. So I think that it's going to be hard, but you're going to just have to really believe in yourself and think what is really what I want. And something that I did is I started working with a business coach and I know that um, there are some free ones out there too that you could look up. Um, but I, I do think aiming higher on what your definition of success is will help you take steps to work in there. I mean, there's definitely a reverse engineering way of what does that mean? Do you need $50,000 a year? Or do you need $100,000 a year? How many contracts do you need to fill that in and, you know, kind of work backwards as far as number of leads per networking event or number of leads per Facebook ad, or I'm not sure how you'd be getting clients, but let somebody else answer if they have a more relevant Response. Well, I'm a word person and the answer is math. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> well, I think it's math. And just to jump in, I also think it's building up your network. 
because you probably are just starting to lean into that and really looking to others that are doing it, have been doing it for a while. And, you know, what I've suggested to people kind of, you know, over the course of time is that whether it's communities via Communo on the Riveter, um, you know, there's a lot of co-working space oriented um, networks, but then also Facebook groups are tremendous in terms of, yeah, um, you know, just entering into and honestly being vulnerable in terms of, hey, I'm just starting out in this. I'm looking for people to kind of help coach me in what I should be expecting in terms of rates, which types of clients are looking right now, you know, what types of things I should really brush up on, if there's any courses that have been really useful. There's just a tremendous amount of knowledge. And frankly, to unlock that, it just does, you, you are really giving in terms of just your vulnerability right now and sharing all of that. So I think you're predisposed to this already and just saying, hey, this is who I am, like getting started, um, you know, would love to DM with a couple people and just get your real take on all of this. And I have just seen the wealth of support on those types of posts on Facebook and people really want to help you, um, you know, whatever your issue is as a human being. But I think just kind of outing yourself a little bit as a, as a noob in the space, um, I think you'd be surprised at how many people just comment on that thread and then also just reach out to you and say, hey, happy to spend 30 minutes on a, on a call. Um, you know, especially at this moment in time, people are looking to support each other. So uh, would you really use those groups to your advantage um, and do that bit of market research as to where you should start and how to best put your, uh, your first foot forward. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, uh, hi, hi, Aaron. It's nice to... It's nice to meet you. Um, okay. How long? How long have you said you you started doing this? A week. Okay. <laughs> I um, just got a client, and I've been working this week. Okay, that's that's <laughs> something to celebrate then. Yes, thank um, you. <laughs> um, congratulations. That's step one. Uh, uh, I, I would say this. I would say, uh, first off, thank you for sharing kind of more intimate and 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 setting the stage and and that's something that's very uh, honorable and I understand how it's a little bit scary and tough but i would say the one advantage i'm looking at right now is also to think especially during covid is when they everyone keeps saying the new normal and i know you're saying you're kind of going through a reset and a transition so is everybody else so the one lucky thing is it's almost like you're like oh we're all new here right like so there's an advantage now to i mean think about it you're in a zoom yeah. having a conference with people doing all this, like if you look back like you know a year ago there's a whole market that would never be doing this and now you're forced to kind of get into it at the same time there might be some com competitive advantage there and and just to also going back to why i try to focus on the specialty thing is you know you said before that you know understanding the writing side of things for someone like me who where uh, uh i'd rather publicly speak in front of people or come up with creative ideas than i would want to actually write something that gives me anxiety to find people like that, you know, so we're all different. We all have our, our, our pros and cons. So the thing that you're best at, that's the thing that you should be kind of focusing on the most. And, you know, I, I always say this, but going back to, uh, uh, you know, your job is to solve problems. If you are, uh, if you said that your, your past role was, uh, 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 of course, educating, taking care of your kids, you're solving more problems than anybody else. So it seems like that is, you know, you, you know, you, your portfolios, I solve all these problems and keep these people living and learning. That sounds kind of what a job is. So I would say, you know, don't, don't lean at that as a negative, that should be uh, uh, absolutely uh, a positive. And then there's a certain amount of confidence and reassuring that you automatically put off, right? Like the reassuring side and your client should, that's something that people pay for. You know, they pay to be reassured that this will get done. And you're saying, hey, look, I've had obstacles. It doesn't matter. I've gotten things done. That's something that will make people feel good. So don't, don't shy away from that. If anything, lean into that. And that's just my getting to know you for, for four seconds over the internet technology. So <laughs> that's all I can give. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate that. Hello. Hi, Brittany. Brittany, what's your story? So my story is very similar to Aaron's, actually. Um, I'm also doing a career pivot from behavioral health as a therapist into UX design. And I'm also new to Seattle. 
So the, a lot of the feedback and advice that you all had for Erin, I found very applicable as well. So that answered some of my questions. Um, I think the best way is to start from where I want to be and work backwards. Eventually, I would love to be principal UX designer for a startup in which I am a founder. So that would be my role in that startup. However, where I am right now is someone who's finishing up at General Assembly in the UX design course. So I've never even had, well, that's not true. I'm working with the city of Seattle right now, but um, as a part of a project, but as an official client that I've exchanged and gotten money and things like that, I haven't done anything. So um, in terms of networking, in terms of finding a niche, um, I believe that was Mike that mentioned that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea, but then I thought, geez, I'm barely starting. How do I niche down when I'm starting? <laughs> I think you have the coolest unique uh, niche I've ever heard. I mean, I'm not trying to jump in, but look, half of business is therapy, right? Like, you know, if you're talking about your, your job, which is kind of, you know, having these discussions, people come to you and they go, I don't know what, to, and you're kind of giving confidence. I actually like th this concept of, you know, UX is really plotting out where people's paths are, how they're walking through things, how they're trying to understand a situation. And, and that sounds like your past profession was listening, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, listening to people, discussing what the different paths are. It sounds like you're already doing it as it is there. So even if, you know, there's two forms of UX, one is actually the wireframe and the other part of UX is actually understanding why and understanding how to make that better. And those are two completely actually, the best people are people can do it both, right? So like there's things that sounds like you've been trained on and you know intuitively, that that's a value add, right? And then now you're talking about learning some new skills, right? Whether that's, you know, the use of software or, or the best, you know, uh, uh, understand what people have used for best case scenario. So I think that if you go in there, the career pivots, it's interesting. Th these should be, my career led me here, you know, like unless of a pivot, like I'm trying to do some new cause this didn't work out. It's like, I'm very unique because I have so much expertise in this, very, you know, uh, the best developer, one of the developers used to work for uh, uh, my company was the founder who became the founder of Venmo. He studied psychology and then learned to code. And he was our CTO and then he went on make Venmo. And he's like, no, psychology helped me more to be a tech entrepreneur than ever coding could ever do. And, and it was because, you know, he, he gave him a whole different mind frame and perspective. And so once again, people are going to learn these skill side for you to have this, this passion, understanding and education that's different. I think that that's where this is going back to how you pitch your project, uh, how you pitch yourself. But that to me sounds like a, a pretty good advantage and niche that you could, you could take advantage of. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add to that before I have to jump, but, um, you know, Brittany, that's a tremendous skill set. And for anybody, you have a narrative in terms of your experience, in terms of your past and why you've iterated into whatever you're getting into, whether it's as a result of this crisis or just an interest and excitement. Brittany, we actually differentiate ourselves as a tool for freelancers because we were freelancers, not from the fintech community, because I was a psych major, because we care about people's behavior and being accessible. And it's, it's, a, it's a differentiating point we use. Um, and also, you know, there's so many companies in the Seattle area, but internationally, that differentiate themselves about addressing cognitive bias that's built into AI at this point and all that sort of stuff. So I'm sure you're tapping into that based on your background, but regardless of what your individual pivot is, there is a value in that past and into the future that you can take advantage of. And it's all about the storytelling, right? So really think about that and then own that as you walk in the door um, you can absolutely do it. And if you are struggling with it, just given the moment in time, just ask three of your friends to say, why am I a badass? You know, like, remind me, like, why do you love me? Why do you think I'm awesome? Like get that little pep talk, but then look at the words that they're using and then weave them into your narrative because that is kind of your compilation of superpowers that you can apply to the the next kind of iteration of yourself. And I think too often we think of ourselves as static beings and really we're constantly iterating and there's a story in that. So that's where I'm going to peace out. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciated wow. this. Wow, Una, that was um, such a mic drop moment. I mean, right? like, that is just so good. Great <laughs> advice.
Thank you for that. Thank you all. And I'm happy for you to reach out to me anytime. Uh, Just O-O-N-A at justlance.co. Happy to help out with anything. But love that you guys were here and um, much love. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good night. This is probably a good time to wrap it up. We're right at seven o'clock. I really appreciate everybody for hanging in, um, going long and uh, providing so much great content. Um, Resources are available on our website. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Let's, uh, um, I'm not really sure where we go from here. (laughs) We're done. I don't wanna let go. I'm holding on. (laughs) Thanks a lot guys. Great to see your faces. Thank you guys so much for participating. Awesome, thanks for the opportunity. Yep, nice to meet everybody. Okay. Thanks guys, bye. Bye, thanks.